antiderivative. So we get tan inverse x equals antiderivative 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. And it's nice to have on your formula page your integrals on the left side of the equation and the antiderivative on the right side. I need a plus c, c plus. So I'm going to switch the order and write it with u's. So we got integral 1 over 1 plus u squared du equals tan inverse u plus c. So that is our antiderivative. And now we're going to go for cotangent inverse. So somewhere up here, we had the cotangent inverse, tangent inverse identity. Hopefully we don't have to go too far. I did write that down. Oh no. Oh, we just completely skipped over that. All right. Well, let's go through that now. All right, so I'm going to start out with the y equals cotangent inverse x. Oh, this is magic. We'll do that right over here where it should be. So y equals cotangent inverse x is the same thing as cot y equals x. We're going to rewrite it 1 over tangent. 1 over tangent y is cotangent y. And then uh, take the reciprocal of both sides, tan y equals 1 over x. And this should all be kind of familiar now. We're just doing this sort of same pattern with different trig functions. So we're not really breaking any new ground doing this stuff at this point. And tangent inverse both sides. So we have y equals tan inverse 1 over x. And we started with y equals cotangent inverse. So that means these are the same y's we're working with. So I can equate cotangent inverse x with tangent inverse 1 over x. So that's the identity we're going to use now. Now they have the reciprocals all have a very the inverse reciprocals all have a very similar uh, relationship. You can basically put secant inverse and cosine inverse together in this way, and uh, what's the other one? Cosecant inverse and sine inverse. So they are they do have that reciprocal relationship, but it's in the like inputs of the function as opposed to the outputs because these are all inverses. All right, so now we're going to use that. Um, cotangent inverse is tangent inverse 1 over x. Down here somewhere. I'm going to take a derivative, so instead of writing 1 over x, in doing the quotient rule, we're going to write x to the negative first. That would be a lot easier to just subtract one from the power and all that fun stuff. So it would be easier this way. All right. I have the derivative tangent inverse. It's 1 over 1 plus the input squared. And then it will be a chain rule happening at the end. So it's 1 over 1 plus x to the negative first squared times d dx, x to the negative first. So that's the chain rule uh, part right there. So I'm going to write x to the negative first is 1 over x, and then square it. And derivative x to the negative first is negative 1 over x squared.
So we get the negative because we're multiplying by negative 1, and then we drop the power by 1, so it's x to the negative 2, which is 1 over x squared. And I know I'm sort of jumping around in different forms depending on what's better for different uh, places for algebra or calculus. Now I'm going to multiply uh, the x squared through the denominator, and then negative 1 just makes everything negative. So we're just doing a little algebra here. We're going to get negative, the whole fraction is negative, 1 over x squared plus 1, like that. And to make it look more similar to the uh, tangent inverse, I'm going to write it as negative uh, 1 over x, oh, uh, 1 plus x squared. And this, of course, is ddx of cotangent inverse x. Okay, questions on any of that chain rule algebra stuff? So every derivative, we're going to get an antiderivative. Our antiderivative is going to look like 1 over 1 plus u squared. There's just going to be a negative hanging out. So it's really similar to the antiderivative uh, that gets you tangent inverse. So it's going to be almost exactly the same, except it's negative. That's the only difference. If we look at these derivatives, what's different? There's a minus sign on the right side. So the difference between tangent inverse derivative and cotangent inverse derivative, there's a minus sign. Like that is literally the entire difference between the two functions, the two derivatives. So if I just write it all out, uh, negative 1 over 1 plus x squared dx is equal to cotangent inverse x plus c. I'm going to swap the two sides and then multiply by negative to make the integral positive. So integral 1 over 1 plus u squared du equals negative cotangent inverse x plus c. Do we gain anything by having do, is there anything we could integrate now that we couldn't integrate with the tangent inverse? Don't really gain anything. If it looks like 1 over 1 plus u squared, just go tangent inverse. Don't do the negative cotangent inverse. It'll save a little space in your cheat sheet. It'll save me from looking at different forms. So I'm going to write uh, extraneous. You don't need it. So true, but I really recommend uh, don't put it on your cheat sheet. It's just going to take up extra space you don't need to have on there. Uh, the derivative, however, you want to keep all six anti, uh, all six derivatives of the inverse trig functions. Those are definitely important. So, you know, tangent inverse derivative, cotangent inverse derivative. You need those. If we scroll up a little further, you need the cos inverse and sine inverse derivatives. You need both of those. But again, sine inverse, the antiderivative we got meant that the uh, other, the cos inverse antiderivative is extraneous. So you only need half of the antiderivatives. You don't need all six of them. All right, up next, we're going to do all the secants, cosecants. So ready to go with those. <coughs> so we'll start off the same pattern. We'll do derivative of secant. secant inverse. So f inverse equals seek inverse. Regular f is regular secant 
f prime derivative secant is secant tangent. Now, because I'm getting lazy and not writing the of x of x part, this would be a sort of bad thing to write, secant tangent like that, because it's not multiply secant, or it's multiply the secant of x times tangent of x. So my laziness is catching up with me here. So I'm going to write f prime of x equals secant of x times tangent of x, because I need to make sure I put x in both functions and multiply the two functions together. All right, we have 1 over f prime of f inverse of x, which is 1 over, now, f prime is secant tangent. But instead of x and x, I have to put in secant inverse, secant inverse. So it's going to be 1 over secant of uh, seek inverse x times tangent of secant inverse of x. So which one is easy to reduce really quickly? Secant secant inverse. Yeah, secant secant inverse cancel out. So the first of the first of the two products is just x, so that's easy. And we still have to deal with tangent secant inverse. So let's deal with that now. Move over to the right here and do our trig right here. Uh, I think I went algebra last time. Can we reuse our algebra? I feel like we can. Somewhere up here, did. Oh, we kind of used the secant squared fact. All right. So you all believe me when I went through all this stuff right here. So this is secant of tan inverse x, whole thing squared. So that's what, it, that's what up here what we meant when it was secant of tangent inverse x. That really meant secant squared. Like take the secant of that stuff and then square the whole thing. So writing it out with uh, parentheses around it's going to look like this. Now, how do I get rid of that squared? square root. So that's all we're going to do here. So secant of tangent inverse of x equals plus or minus square root 1 plus x squared. So we're going to use that identity. So we got secant of tangent inverse x is plus or minus 1 plus x squared square root. Oh, yeah, that will matter. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So yeah, I was about to be disappointed, but you just made me disappointed a little extra quickly. Secant tangent inverse, tangent secant inverse. Yes, those are not the same thing. No. All right. So we're going to have to go and actually do the uh, trigonometry work over here. All right. So I'll simplify tan sec inverse x. So we'll go triangle route this time. So inside secant inverse x, we're going to let that be theta. So let theta equal secant inverse x. And secant theta equals x. We need a fraction, so we always just divide by 1. And secant is 1 over cosine hypotenuse over adjacent. All right. And whenever you're dealing with uh, undetermined, if you don't know if x is positive or negative, or even 0, just draw a quadrant 1 triangle. And if x is positive or negative, it will just work out. So on these, you don't have to worry about quadrants, which is pretty nice. So triangle, pretend that's quadrant 1. Hypotenuse is x adjacent 1. The other side, if I call it adjacent opposite, I don't want to use o. <coughs> We're not using a y anywhere around here, so I'll go with a, I'll go with a y. Uh, one squared plus y squared equals x squared. We want to know what is y, so subtract one. 
y squared equals x squared minus 1 square root, y equals plus or minus square root x squared minus 1. All right, so that is our other side, and now we're ready to write down what is tangent. Theta is opposite over adjacent. Well, adjacent's one, so that's nice. It's really just the opposite side then. Plus or minus square root. And I think the other one was one plus x squared. So it's a good thing we didn't use that. It would have been very wrong. Oh, it could be negative. Uh, there is a problem with the way I wrote it, though. So what is wrong with the way I wrote plus or minus right here? What does it look like we're doing compared to what we should be doing? Adding or so like we're adding or subtracting. What I want to be doing is multiplying by positive or a negative. So we're going to parenthesize like that. So it's multiplied by either positive or negative square root. Now, that's a horrible way to write it. The better way to write it is bring the plus or minus outside. Much better way to write it like that. OK, so that was a fun trip back through trig land. Now, seek an inverse. I think I wrote down the domain. And I think I messed it up and then corrected it. So let's, instead of trying to guess what it is, I'm going to scroll up and see what we wrote down with secant inverse. It's somewhere up here, secant inverse. So with secant y equals x, this would be the range of the secant function on the right side here. This is the range of secant y, which will be equal to the domain of secant inverse x. So the range of secant would be the domain of secant inverse. All right, we probably don't need to be this careful. There's going to be plenty of bad values, bad x values to plug in. x squared minus 1, it's pretty easy to make that 0. How do you make that 0? Uh, if x equals 1 or negative 1, you're 0. So that's bad. What if x is really small, like 0? What do we get if we square 0 and subtract 1? Negative 1, and then we square root that. So we actually have to have x bigger than 1 and small, or smaller than negative 1. So we can't have a small x here, because then you'll be having imaginary values. Uh, so the way we're going to take care of that, basically needs you bigger than 1 or smaller than 1. And depending on if you're bigger than 1 or smaller than 1, that's where the plus minus comes in. So writing down, so I don't really want to write the whole domain of secant inverse. Um, you know what, I have a graph here in my notes that should be good. So let me just copy that graph down. And this should help explain a lot of what's going on. The problem with these inverse functions, you have to ensure one-to-oneness. And all of these reciprocal type functions have vertical asymptotes, which turn into horizontal asymptotes which generally mean there's two pieces to the function. So we didn't really go over how to graph this, so I'm just really quickly going to graph what this function looks like. The vertical asymptote is going to turn into this horizontal asymptote right here. And it will be y equals, I want to say pi over 2. So I believe that should be pi, and then the asymptote would be pi over 2. No. Didn't label it on my notes. 
we'll go and look at the original secant function. We had that somewhere up here. Secant. Yeah, so our we're basically using this part right here. And when we invert it, our vertical asymptote pi over 2 turns into a horizontal asymptote pi over 2. And then that uh, x value of pi is going to turn into a y value of pi. So there we go. Um, and this is the secant inverse graph. You have to be a little careful because when you find the derivative, you get undefined. So these are points in the secant inverse graph, these endpoints, but in the derivative, they will be undefined. What do you think that means if I, and this is not a perfect graph, but if I zoomed in, what do you think? The derivative is a slope. So what would that correspond to undefined right here at that point that I zoomed into? And I could write a better curve of this function. All right. So what do you think that undefined slope would correspond to in terms of what the slope is doing when it gets close to that point? Limit. So you can think of limit. The slope is getting more and more steep. So the fact that it's undefined at the point means it's actually a vertical slope at that point. So it gets steeper and steeper and steeper is actually vertical at that point. Uh, the same thing happens here. It's a vertical slope. In this case, you could think of it as a negative infinity slope as opposed to positive infinity. Um, if I drew a better graph, it would look a little more curved like that right there. So it would come out very steep. So it's a little weird. The derivative is defined on a slightly smaller set than the actual um, inverse function itself because there's a vertical derivative at those two points. All right, so this down. I will write down the you know positive or negative. If you look at the graph, what is the slope on the left half of the graph, positive or negative? So the left part of the graph. Positive or negative? Don't look at the arrow. That's going to confuse you. Positive. We're going up to the right. Up to the right. And then on the l did I? This part of the graph is what I was looking at. I may have said the wrong side. This part of the graph on the right side is positive slope. So positive slope here, negative slope over there. All right, so if your x is positive here, you should have positive slope. If your x is negative, you should have positive slope. It's increasing. <laughs> you're going to the right, you're going up in either of the two sections, right? I mean, not in the middle, there's no function right here. <laughs> but either of the two sections, you're increasing. So the slope should be positive, no matter what. So how do we write that out? We're going to use negative x if x was negative to make it positive. And then regular x if x is already positive. So there's a few ways to write this. One way to simplify it is like that. If x was negative, you take the absolute value, hey, it's positive. So this is the easy way to write down the secant inverse derivative. In one shot, if you like step functions, you can write it out. 1 over x square root x squared minus 1. And this will be if, f, if x was already positive. And this, for us, is going to be greater than 1. And the other one, 1 over negative x square root x squared minus 1. x squared minus 1 if x was less than 1. I'm going to just use the absolute value version. It lets me avoid a plus minus everywhere. So I'm just going to go with the absolute value and make life a little easier. So this is our derivative. We're going to move the derivative to the other side with the antiderivative. Same thing we've been doing. So we have secant inverse x equals integral 1 over 
absolute value of x square root x squared minus 1 dx and then turn it on to use and then just write the equation in the other order so we get integral 1 over absolute value of u square root u squared minus 1 du equals secant inverse u plus c Notice the absolute value on u is on the other side. So I think it comes from the fact that secant is no. All right, I'm just going to write down what I have in my notes instead of trying to go through every single detail. So this absolute value is going to get removed on the left and on the right you get the absolute value over there all right so that's what's in my notes right there to me their book no for a good cheat sheet so I did. I went through all the um, derivative inverses, and then I double checked my answers off. So you have the one I wrote down the first time with the yeah, absolute one value. Over absolute value x times square root x squared minus one. For the derivative or the antiderivative? Oh, well, that's a good question. So I think the derivative I have. So we agree on the derivative. Yeah. Okay. I feel good about that. In my notes, I have it written with absolute value on the secant inverse side, not on the uh, antiderivative side. All right, generally, I won't nitpick about absolute value in this class. So if you forget the absolute value, I generally don't take points off for that. So you don't need to worry so much about the absolute values, unless you're on the mission to Mars or something like that, and you want to go to Mars instead of into nowhere. Uh, but for this class, I won't worry so much about absolute values. OK. So we're on page four. And I think we only have one more of these to do, and then it's all examples. Um, and then after that, it's all hyperbolic trig, which is a lot easier than it sounds. In my opinion, it's easier than inverse trig. It's new, but not tricky. Uh, is it time to go? All right. So you should be able to do quite a few problems from 7.6, although I haven't done any examples yet. So try to finish any 7.5.